support that. You're listening to Gavin Richard Presents here on Channel GBOOP 2786, the best live stream uh, media talk on the internet, on YouTube. Whoever you are, wherever you are, I hope you are blessed and doing safe. We are waiting for our guest of honor, Mr. Carl Galman, to come and join with us. He's going to be talking about a little bit of black history, but also on some stuff with regards to gerrymandering that's going on in the state of Louisiana. And we're going to be uh, chopping up with him and talk to him, uh, whoever you are, wherever you are. I hope you are blessed and doing safe on this beautiful Sunday afternoon. We're going to keep kick it right now on, uh, in a few minutes. We're going to just keep the music playing until we wait for our guest of honor. But this is Channel G Blue 2786. I'm Gavin Richard with Gavin Richard Presents. So y'all do not touch that dial. We'll be right back.
Y'all are tuning in to the baddest live stream on YouTube. We are still awaiting our guest, Mr. Carl Galman. He is going to be in real shortly. Uh, just a little information on Mr. Galman. I'm going to ask him about this too. Uh, you guys, Mr. Galman has served as a deputy director of divisionary programs for the New Orleans, Louisiana office parish, Orleans Parish District Attorney's Office. And a director, I gotta turn the music off, even though it's great. He's the direct former director of African American Affairs for the City of New Orleans Mayor's Office, a teacher. Uh, he's taught civics and physical education at junior high school to junior high school students uh, in New Orleans public school system. And he's also a former professional baseball pitcher for the Boston Red Sox Class A Farm Organization. Uh, he's been affiliated with several civil rights organizations from the National Voting Rights Museum and Institute of Selma, Alabama, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the Coalition for a People's Agenda for the State of Georgia, and he's a charter member of Selma to Montgomery Historic Voting Rights Trail. His accomplishments included, includes spearheading efforts to integrate the executive committee of the New Orleans Sugar Bowl game after 40 years of segregation. He was also instrumental in getting 45 black colleges admitted to the NCAA Division I AA uh, program after 68 years of no black colleges being members of the association. He led the fight to get three permanent voter registration branches in the African-American community, obtained funding from Voter Education Project Incorporated and the A. Philip Randolph Institute and registered over 22,000 new African-American voters, uh, making it possible to elect its first black mayor, which was none other than Dutch Morial. He led the fight to rename public sc schools here in New Orleans named after former slave owners and slave traders. Of the 121 schools, 49 were named for slaveholders. 26 uh, schools in the district where more than 91% of the students were black have been renamed. In 1996, he filed racial discrimination charges with the Office of Civil Rights, United States Department of Education to end discrimination and magnet schools in New Orleans area. He is married to Miss Gloria Benoit Galman, and Mr. Galman has two children, Kevin and Keisha, and two grandchildren, Kevin Jr. and Carissa. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, our guest has arrived. Please welcome, let me turn on my camera as well. Uh, please welcome Mr. Carl Galman to the show. Mr. Galman, Hello. I can see him. Hold on, let me turn. Mr. Galman, I can see y'all. Testing one, two. Everybody can hear me? Okay, so they're in the building, guys. Uh, I can hear you. Mm -hmm. I see you connecting. This is also unstable. The connection's unstable. Language. 
screen. You can see me, Mr. Galvin. Okay. We're having a little technical difficulty. I'm trying to get him in. Uh, what I know people on Facebook and YouTube, you guys can hit me all all on channel G Boot 2786 that's watching. Let me know if you can hear me or if my connection is unstable, if you're having issues, if I'm lagging. It looks like I'm fine, but apparently Mr. Galman's having some issues and he got kicked out. So what I'll probably do, I'm going to try and just, uh, we'll try and do it over the phone because that might be a little bit better in case. Let me just give him a call. Y'all give me a second. Fine. Yeah, we'll do it over the phone. Uh, guys, uh, Mr. Galvin, welcome to the show. Thank you. Okay. Um, just I got my followers on here on YouTube. Uh, I'm just waiting for people to say hello, but some people are tuning in. I've already done your introduction, Mr. Galvin. Uh, thank you. Uh, I've been trying to get you on the show since last year, uh, actually, at the end. Uh, you know, and at that time you had made your 80th birthday. So happy belated birthday to you. Thank you, Beckham. I appreciate it. I needed that. <laughs> no problem. Always. I missed the gavel to gerrymandering and some of the work you've done. And I want, but I think it's even fitting that you come on here because this is February 28th and this is the last day of black history month. And I wanted to talk about, uh, you know, you've been a historical figure. Uh, in the fight for civil rights for black people. Uh, but I wanted to have you come on also just to talk about you because a lot of people may not know, especially out there, know who you are. Mr. Galvin, you, I want to mention this, and I was telling this to the people earlier, but you were a baseball pitcher for the Boston Red Sox. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, you know, I played four years at Grambling State University, and uh, after my extension, I signed with uh, – uh, the Boston Red Sox. Uh, I played with a bomb organization, a uh, Wadalawa. Mm -hmm. And I had used my free deferments while I was in college, and I got drafted. And uh, I had a choice between the Army and I went into the U.S. Air Force. And so, uh, during that time in 1964 and 65, uh, they were accepting blacks into the National Guard here in Louisiana. See, uh, and across the state now, uh, and also Louisiana, white boys can join the National Guard if they play sports. Right. During the off season, they participated in the National Guard. But that window was not open for black athletes. If you use your three deferments in college, uh, you had to go for a time in the military. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so I took the test of the United States Air Force, and I made a pretty good school, and so they accepted me in the United States Air Force. Oh, uh, that's what ended my baseball career. And the number of athletes that played ball in the Southwestern Athletic Conference, uh, at that time, it was the NEIA, uh, a National uh, Athletic Intercollegiate Association. Uh, all of the predominant black schools was a member of the NEIA. Uh, in 1974, I was with the Southern, 1974, I was with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and Dr. Raph Abernathy was the president of uh, SELC. Yeah. That organization was founded by Dr. Martin Luther King. Right. And the first conference that closed down, the predominant black conference, was the Gulf Coast Conference. Xavier and Dillard University, Bishop and Wiley, Houston Tillerson, they made up of the Gulf Coast Conference. And that whole conference closed down because they could not compete for the better black athletes because they had integrated the schools. And you find schools like that conference, like the SEC, 
the Big Ten and, 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 and many of the white conferences was competing for the top black athlete. When the Gulf Conference closed down, and Dr. Abbott had to say sooner or later, they're going to propose down to the uh, SWAC conference uh, and the MEAC conference. That's what Paul and M was a member of the MEAC conference. And uh, there's two other conferences that existed that was predominantly black. And so he told uh, me, since you went to Grambling and, and, and you pretty close to Eddie Robinson, I would like you to initiate trying to get the SWAC conference admitted to the NC2A. Mm hmm. And we initiated that, and, and also we received support from Father Hirschberg. A lot of people don't know Father Hirschberg, who was the president of Notre Dame, was a good friend of Dr. Martin Luther King. Right. And Father Hirschberg supported Dr. King in many of civil rights issues. But the media has kept it from the people that uh, Father Hirschberg was a supporter of the civil rights movement. And so... Uh, that was in 1964. Oh, no, I'm sorry. No, that was 1974. Notre Dame was playing University of Alabama in the Sugar Bowl. Yeah. And Bob the Hirschberg was the president of Notre Dame. So in, in, in 1974, we requested uh, Bob the Hirschberg of Notre Dame to support us in this effort. And the AP, AP, uh, 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 ABC. And that was a university, that was a television station and network that had a monopoly. Right. On college sport. They still do. And so, and so they still do. You're right about that. And so, uh, so Father Hirschberg and civil rights organizations mm -hmm. like FCLC and NAACP, the civil rights a number of organizations I was the one I worked with and I initiated the answer on information. Mm -hmm. A lot of the information about the uh, NC two A uh, came from Coach Eddie Robinson. Mm -hmm. I had no idea uh, where the head office was located, the headquarters of the NC two A. It was in Shawnee Mission, Kansas. So we filed a formal complaint through the uh, EEOP. That's a federal uh, uh, agency that right. dealt with discrimination. So we submitted uh, our information mm -hmm. to EEOC. And, and the president of the NC2A, they wanted to know, initiate a settlement. And so the first conference that was accepted to the NC2A was the SWAT conference. That's how they got admitted in 1974. And the Picayune, Bob Rossler, uh, he was the a news and sports editor. He refused to write anything about that. He said by writing an article about Paul Galman initiating and getting the SWAC conference admitted to the NC two A with giving too much credit. Right. Neither the the Times Picayune or the Green Television Station right here in New Orleans did any kind of news story regarding that. Till today they have never mentioned it. About how the SWAC conference got admitted to the NC two A. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, so Wow, yeah, and you did that in 1974, and that was, uh, of course, 10 years after the Civil Rights Act of uh, 1964, right. Right. then uh, Voting Rights Act of 1965. Uh, I, But I wanted to ask you, especially about the baseball career, because you got drafted. I was just telling everybody earlier, I was wondering if you had the chance to beat Hank Aaron, and I was thinking that because Hank Aaron had just recently passed away if you had a story and you told me well, well, well Hank Aaron uh, uh, he played in Old Negro right that was when things were segregated okay uh, first time I saw Hank Aaron was at Pelican Stadium that was on the uh, corner of Tulane Avenue and Calvin Avenue that is the stadium there. and I saw Hank Aaron play Willie Mays Brooke Lawrence Harry Suitcase Simpson and many of the guys, uh, uh, Junior Gillum, who played for the Dodgers, and a number of uh, big league baseball players, Don Newcomb, they had that all-star team that they played in. And I saw Hank Aaron play right at uh, uh, Old Pelican Stadium. Uh, during the summer, I had a chance to play against his brother. His brother was named Tommy Aaron. They were from Mobile, Alabama. And, and uh, uh, Mobile, Alabama, to do some of the best baseball players uh, in the major league. Uh, you remember uh, uh, 
Prince Frank and Billy Williams, who played for the Chicago Cubs. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my cousins who played first base for the uh, uh, San Francisco Giants. Uh, many ball players came out of Mobile, Alabama. Ball players. Uh, uh, you know, William Hayes, I think he was from Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, he played center field. So, when you take a look at Alabama, they produce some great baseball players. Uh, and so, uh, and, and the major leagues took advantage of that, and, and that led to the demise of the Negro League because they was getting every major, uh, every black ball player with major league potential. But they was putting them, they was uh, uh, not only they wasn't drafting them, then they were signing them to play in the major league. Yeah. They through the crowd. Lou Brown, right? Played uh, center field for State University in right field. Okay, uh, he played right field at State University. Right. And Lou Brown. Signed, uh, Jack played, Walsh. Uh, Major League Baseball. He first signed with the Cubs. Right. He ended up a uh, uh, league in the Major League and stolen bases several years. Uh, he played right field for the uh, St. Louis Cardinals. Right. But basically, you can see a number of baseball people in Tommy right. E.G., who I played with at Ramon, uh, Tommy E.G. played with the, uh, uh, the Mets when he won the World Series. Uh, uh, Ralph Garth, uh, he played out there for Graham. He ended up playing with the Milwaukee Braves. Uh, so you can see a number of black ball players came out this white time. Uh, Vince Coleman, I think, played for Florida A&M. He had the major league stolen bases. So, uh, you had a number of baseball players, but what really, uh, turned black folks off, they stopped drafting, stopped signing these black ball players from historical black colleges. And begin to go to South America and Central America to sign black ball players. But many of the ball players that played in the major league that came out to Swipe Conference and it's uh, uh, the at Conference, they couldn't carry any gloves. And so you take a look at Major League Baseball today, uh, you don't have those superstars playing today. Right. There's a major drop in attendance because you don't have guys like Kurt Flood. Uh, William Hayes, uh, guys who played outfield, and Tommy A.G., they can go and take it off the wall. But you don't find those kind of ball players. You don't find ball players today feeling 100 bases. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and it was exciting to go to the ball game and watch guys like Lou Brock and, and, and Murray Wells and, and, and Ralph Gaw, uh, uh, who played right field for Graham, and you don't know when they're going to take off at first base. That was the most exciting part of a baseball game is watching somebody steal second at third base. Yeah. You know, Jackie Robinson, uh, he stole home several times. Yeah. And it's interesting, you, we're talking about baseball and mentioning that too, uh, Mr. Galman, and that is, is that, uh, and Lou Brock also, he passed away last year, but also Charlie Pride was also in the Negro Leagues at one point. Uh, before. Well, right, Charlie Pride played in the Negro Leagues. Right. You know, the, uh, he changed his career from playing baseball to music. Yeah, the country music yeah, yeah. star. All you know the history, young man. Well, I yeah, I have, uh, keep up on it. I read all the time on Wikipedia stuff like this. So, but I it comes to mind because recently uh, the MLB just finally accepted the uh, Negro Leagues into the, their stats into the Major League Baseball Hall of Fame. All the stats that they yeah, have. Kansas. A lot of blacks don't know that. But the uh, Hall of Fame uh, for the old Negro League, now which is part of now of the Major League, is in Kansas. And very seldom you hear people to talk about going to Kansas and do the Hall of Fame for the, uh, the great ball players that are uh, 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 not only in the Negro League but in the Major League. Yeah. And 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 they had a guy said they had a guy who played baseball. He was a steal bases than old Negro called Cool Papa Bell. Yes. And there was a saying about it, the fact that he can cut the lights off and see and be able to lights go out. That's how quick he was. And, oh, uh, about him, Cooper, I was there. And, and, and uh, there's another ball player who played in Grandma's name, like the late Frank Garnett. Frank Garnett time with the Washington Senators. Uh, and he played for a while. And, and, and he's one of the better hitters in the Swipe Conference. Uh, you 
had a number of ball players uh, uh, that, that, that played, and, and, and they were great ball players. Right. But yeah. you find during that time, uh, the white newspapers, daily papers, somehow they had a problem with covering uh, uh, black ball players. Right. Like when I signed with the ball, with the Boston Red Sox, not a television station or a white newspaper carried that information. For example, Rosa Taylor, one of the late Rosa Taylor, who played with the Chicago Bears. Uh, he signed out a grand family. He signed with the Chicago Bears. When John Harris was the coach. Yeah. And Rosa made all pro. But when Rosa signed, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't do no article on Rosa Taylor. Mm -hmm. And another guy who played for a grandma called Frank Cornish. Okay? Richard Kingstone Jackson, who played with the Denver Broncos. Okay? And, 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 and he was a great ball player. But somehow, the, 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 the Times Picayune and, and the three television station, they wasn't about to give that kind of coverage to a black athlete. No. During the, during the 60s and 70s. Right, right, and especially in the 60s and 70s, they didn't give that coverage. And even with Hank Aaron, when he broke Babe Ruth's record, uh, he's actually he's actually the most he is uh, actually a star that has received the most tape mail than any other celebrity, uh, to my knowledge. He actually had to have his own secretary go through. There was actually a secretary for the Atlanta Braves that actually had to go in and read all of his mail. And answer or open all of the hate mail that he received, and he still received it, I believe, to this day, uh, because Hank Aaron actually did a lot of things in Atlanta. A lot of people don't know. Uh, well, some people in Atlanta, the people in Georgia area, know this, but he was an astute businessman. Uh, you're talking about he had multiple uh, franchises. Car that, yes, he six car dealerships, and he left the car dealership business and. He owned a number of Krispy Kremes, chicken, yeah, uh, franchise in, 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 in metropolitan uh, Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, in fact, my nephew is, is one of the major uh, uh, managers uh, of Popeyes. Uh, he lived right here in New Orleans, mm -hmm. and, and, and he's, he's always going in and out of the city of New Orleans and going through opening a new franchise across the South. Oh, and, 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 and he's one of the highest ranking blacks, my nephew. Okay, but I'm saying to you, when you come down to trying and giving black credibility for doing positive things, right. the news media uh, somehow, they get, I, would, I wouldn't say they're paranoid, but somehow they don't have space in their news media uh, to give positive uh, and you, Frank, you, you, you mentioned the name of a number of ball players that a lot of young folks today don't even know anything about them. Okay? Right. You ask the young kid, they oh, it's Murray Wills. Oh, it's Willie McCovey. Willie Mays. That's, that's totally foreign to them. Yeah. Because, you know, uh, uh, they don't get that positive coverage. What? Uh, well, I think that... that your ball. Lost your ball. Played in Carver High School. Yes, he did. Marsh they all grow in the Hall of Fame. And you've got kids playing high school right now, football right now. You ask, can you tell me about Marsh your ball? Who's that? It's showing that we have a serious lack of communication. So I'm, so, I'm so glad to see you with this cultural oh. program. Oh, thank you. And you're doing a very positive job. Thank you. Of educating the community. Okay? Very positive job. In fact, you've given more coverage to Hank Aaron and any of the new services today in the city of New Orleans. In fact, throughout the state of Louisiana. Yeah. A lot of people, not, that, that was nothing mentioned that Hank Aaron played baseball well, right here in New Orleans. Okay? A lot right. of people don't know that. Without your, without your programs, uh, a lot of you listen to all of what you know about Hank Aaron played ball right here and you know, they were all stuff. They right. had it every year. Uh, oh, oh. The man who was the, I call the godfather of North was, was Morris Jeff. Oh, yeah. He, yeah, he played a major role in, 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 in keeping us involved and, 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 and keeping North a program as a top program in the nation. Not only in baseball, 
and he had basketball track. Jack more track meet than he had like kids to be a playground. Okay? Right. So you go to that particular uh, track meet, Jack more track meet, that was put on by Noah. If you got that leg, you couldn't find a seat. We had to stand up during the whole track meet. We had eight more be abilities. Okay? It's the main thing is the fact that there is no coverage. of the positive things that's happening in African American Okay? So we got to create our own media and, and, and the biggest problem we find here in New Orleans and back throughout the state. We spend too much time depending on the white media to educate us about issues important to black people. Mm-hmm. See nobody don't save us but us for us. And we have to realize that, you know, and, and this is one hour down downfall. Now, we, we have a, a, a black radio uh, station. We have a black newspaper. But the reason they can't flourish like these whites, they can't get the advertise for dollar. If you go on a radio station, you go on a television station, it's mandatory that you get advertised so you can pay your staff. Right. They can't get that. And it's done intentionally. Right. You shut down any media for any k well, that's. And I'm so proud and glad they can't shut you down. Well, they can't. Sh- well, they've tried to. Uh, <laughs> you know, we're not. Not a radio. I mean, this is not radio. This is internet. So it's a little bit more broader. However, on you know, ch- on channels like this uh, across YouTube, as well as on Facebook and on different other accounts, uh, say for instance on Periscope. They have started in recent times to try and censor a lot of people uh, with certain things. So they have been trying. Uh, But, you know, with radio in the last few years, radio has actually died down uh, in large part, especially black radio. uh, In large part, it had to do with the 1996 Telecommunications Act that was signed by Bill Clinton because it allowed uh, corporations and conglomerates to buy out uh, you know, smaller programs, smaller companies, almost cr- essentially creating a monopoly. So when I look at, for instance, uh, 98.5, which is the top R&B station here in Louisiana, well, that's now controlled by iHeartRadio. And iHeartRadio uh, has control over uh, hundreds of uh, networks and radio programs. Uh, I think they also are involved with Q93, if I'm not mistaken. They have some of the top programs in radio now so a lot of that is not black owned anymore which is why sometimes they were not able to get and talk about the issues that we want uh because someone else is pulling the purse controlling the purse strings that's right yeah. you know it, it, it's right so you know we, we had a form of communication during the civil rights movement okay uh and we found out what was happening locally and nationally for example, during the civil rights movement, uh, if you want to find out what's going on in black America, you go to church here on Sunday. Then the preacher from the pulpit will educate you about what's happening in the civil rights movement. Because that's how they got the message to the people that had a concern about civil rights and human rights. Even your daddy went to St. Augustine High School. Yep. Say no, only they black boys Catholic high school in the country. Uh Father O'Rook died uh before I even remember him. Uh, I even I met him. Your, so. your daddy him. Yeah. Father O'Rook and and, 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 and he and he, he was the one that motivated many of the students that went to St. Albert. It was important that they get involved in civil rights. Mm-hmm. And another person which people have to know talk about today is Father Hersberg in Notre Dame. Right, Father Hersberg. He was very good friends with Dr. Martin Luther King. And I got a picture of Dr. King and Father Hersberg, which I'm going to show to you, you, you and your daddy one day. Okay, and cool. And the deal is that the white media refused to show that picture that Father Hirschberg, who was president of Notre Dame University, was, was very good friends with Dr. Martin Luther King. That was a lot of white nuns that supported 
uh, the civil rights movement, especially the Martin Luther King Jr. Right. But then I, I had, I got a picture of the nuns who got put on the civil rights people who got beat up on the uh, uh, Edmund Pettus Bridge. Bridge. Yeah. That was, they were the only one that would treat them at Good Samaritan Hospital, which was run by the uh, nuns of Rochester. And they were there in 2013 at the 50th anniversary of the Samuel to Montgomery March. And I walked up to a reporter. I said, uh, I, I said, you're only talking to black people. I said, they got white nuns here at the march. That was the only folk that was providing uh, a medical treatment to folks. When they got beat up on Edmund Pettus Bridge. He said, well, my editor told me I'm going to talk to black folks. I said, why did your editor tell you I'm going to talk to black folks? And there were a number of white participators in this part of the 7th German government. I said, they had three whites lost their lives on the 7th German government march. Reverend Reed over on Washington Avenue in Selma, he was killed by the clans in a hate group. By Lorenzo, she was killing Bringer folks back from Montgomery to Selma, and they took her flame shot and killed her all the way back down Highway 80. And Reverend Jonathan Daniel, that was killed right there in Hainesville, right on Highway 80, organized the people to participate in the march. I said, why are you trying to turn the march from Selma to Montgomery? an all-black event. That's what the white media is good at. In other words, even the Black uh, Lives Matter march. They try to turn it into an all-black event when many whites participate, all nationality. Uh, that's, a, that, that's a way of trying to marginalize anything we tend to do if it's multiracial. Or they feel if they give a multiracial perspective on something, it would give their effort c- credibility. But that's the game of the white media, especially in the deep south. Yeah, most definitely. And, uh, you know, now we have, uh, thank goodness for internet and so forth, as well as getting in touch with other people. You know, we're able to access and get our message and point across to everyone. And uh, we got people in the chat room right now who are uh, saluting us, uh, talking to us. I see Derek. He says, salute, Gavin. Hello. How you doing? Okay, I'm back. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't know what happened there, but uh, looks like we had yeah, just a little uh issue here with the computer. So I guess it's their way of trying to block us from talking. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. I hear you, brother. Yeah. I want to ask you something. And and and, and uh, I definitely want to educate people about what's going on today. I think it's late for the suppression. Sure. Uh, before and we get. Wait, wait, Mr. Galman. The vote is right back there. The 1965 or the 1965. Yeah, Mr. Okay. Right. All right, Attorney, uh, uh, Richard, you had another topic you want to talk about? Uh, yeah, I was trying to say before you get into that, I did want to ask you a question of news that came out. I just want to know your thoughts. Uh, it was shown recently uh, a deathbed confession about a man who was involved with the assassination of Malcolm X. His name was Ray Goodwood. Did you hear that story? I, I, I never heard the, the name, but I, I do know that that was a serious conspiracy to get rid of Malcolm X and, uh, uh, by a number of people because he was doing a very good job educating black folks. Yeah. And there's old African proverb that said, one without knowledge of self. Property without roots. And so 
he was moving in a different direction. Mm-hmm. A lot of people don't know Malcolm X was talking about black people in America, making the connection with most of Africa. Right. Okay. And he would begin to educate them about the, edu- about the economic potential of black people making the connection, uh, connection with Mother Africa. And that was one of the primary reasons he was assassinated. Yes. Yes. A uh, guy by the name and, of, and I just want to point this out too, uh, Mr. Galman, a gentleman from Kenya. Uh, he was a journalist. His name was uh, Dep- uh, Pio De Pinto. Pinto was a assassinated at least three days after Malcolm X was around the same time. So according to Dick Gregory, he was the one that was trying to get Malcolm to connect with the different African nations. And supposedly he gets assassinated that same week. Malcolm was assassinated. Malcolm was assassinated February 21st, 1965. And Pinto was assassinated uh, February 24th. And I don't think to this day they have completely solved even that case. But it was basically, as Dick Gregory said, two for the price of one, that they got those guys in the same day because Malcolm was uh, threatening to go forward to the United Nations on the uh, human rights charges against the United States. Not that the United States would follow it because the United States is bound by the Constitution, but never to learn to do from what we've all heard. That's very heavy. Let, let me say this. Oh, uh, when you take a look at the continent of Africa, I've been out the nine times. In fact, I headed up the, uh, the anti-apartheid movement mm-hmm. uh, in this region. Uh, I worked with uh, John Conyers, yeah. Ron Dellum out of California, uh, a number of folks, uh, Richard Knight of the Africa Front, and a number of people. And I had a chance to meet Oliver Tambo in 1987. And he made me a member of the uh, ANC African National Congress. Mm-hmm. See, Africa is the richest continent in the world. Mm-hmm. Made up of 54 countries. It, and they got all kind of precious minerals there. Right. Lithium, uranium, plutonium. Cool. Okay. You name it for today. The best kept secret that the United States of America get the majority of the crude oil from Africa, from in West Africa. And many of the news media were lying and said coming from the Persian Gulf. The Persian Gulf is not in Africa. Okay? So mm. they don't want blacks knowing this. For example, you've got in Louisiana, you've got a uh, water for three. That's in St. Charles Parish. You've got a uh, river bend station in nuclear plant in, in West Louisiana Parish. The majority of the uranium that they get to put to to uh, uh, give energy to make energy from some of your uranium. It's the isotopes in the uranium produce the nuclear energy. Comes from South Africa. Very little. So yeah. They're doing everything in the world to keep black people ignorant of the potentials in Africa. That's why Donald Trump referred to Africa as a whole country. Because when Barack Obama was president, they had the largest African summit in the history of this country held in, in, in D.C. They had 50, they 48 nations there. Out of 54 was at this summit. Barack Obama committed $33 billion in foreign aid to Africa. He appointed a number of ambassadors to Donald Trump when he became president. He cut the foreign aid and brought the black ambassadors home from Africa. Because the deal is that they don't want black folks leaving America going to Africa and get educated to come back and educate people in America. 
Paul's important in possession, pointed by Biden. He's pointing Major Austin as Secretary of Defense. And the young lady from Bank of Louisiana named Linda Thomas Greenfield as ambassador to the United Nations. That's why the Republicans voted against her at a confirmation because uh, uh, because the deal is that she had too close a ties to Africa. In fact, she was ambassador to Liberia. She spent a lot of time in Kenya. She very familiar with the continent of Africa, which they have 54 countries. And they feel that she was not a she of obtaining in Africa. She might come back and motivate a number of people here in Louisiana. We got a poor city here that's not doing business in Africa by black folks. We are poor city. But today, the city of Atlanta, Georgia, is doing major trade with Africa because they got a currency exchange in Atlanta, Georgia. Well, banks are willing to do a currency exchange with countries on the continent of Africa. Here in Louisiana, not a bank in Louisiana are willing to do a currency exchange here. Uh, I serve as, uh, as, as a director of African Affairs under Mark Morrell. We tried to get three countries on the continent of Africa, very stable countries, when a consulate, he's open consulate here in New Orleans. I'm talking about South Africa when Mandela became president. That was in 2004. Ghana and Nigeria. The currency in, in South Africa is the RAND. Uh, uh, the currency in Ghana is the CD. And the currency in Nigeria is the Naira. Very stable countries in Africa. Not a bank. In Louisiana, was willing to do a currency exchange, but in Atlanta, Georgia, they was willing to do a currency exchange, and then they got made the trade going in Atlanta with, with Africa. You got planes flying out of Atlanta every day going to yes. great parts of Africa. Well, the Atlanta uh, Airport, Hartfield Jackson, is the third busiest airport in the world, not just in the country, Thank in you. the world, and. Uh, that is because, in large part, because of Maynard Jackson. But Maynard Jackson, I have to say this in relation to what you were saying earlier, I feel that many of our leaders don't give tangibles or are not trying to give tangibles to black Americans uh, in particular. You know, I think that, you know, while it's great that we have people that look like us in office, they also need to be accountable and to give certain things. And I feel, uh, you know, back then in the 70s just from stuff that i was talking about listening to like maynard how he developed atlanta's airport he actually presented to them it's 80 percent for minority contractors for black contractors and they're going to get 80 percent of this and you take 20 and you can take it or leave it and uh -huh. but you know what about maynard jackson uh-huh he was on both unboss and unbought, U-N-B-O-U-G-H-T, when he was in the office. He didn't run to white Republicans and get money drawn as a Democrat. So I've been doing research here in Louisiana about black elected officials. The reason they can't speak up when it comes down to getting business contracts and construction contracts, because many of them, are running as Democrats and getting their campaign money from Republicans. And when it come down to the issue in the major country, let me give you the perfect example. After Hurricane Katrina, the all these parents school boards received one billion eight hundred million dollars mm -hmm. to build twenty five new schools or renovate school to refurbish schools came to 75 schools. Can you name me one black contract in all these parents, the city limits, that received a major contract? And we got a majority of black school board. That's the difference between Maynard Jackson and our school board. Okay? So that's why we cannot make progress. Because the people who we have sent into office, of elected public office, they've all been paid for. Mm -hmm. We need to, the 
raise our own money. And when Maynard was smart enough to make sure blacks got contracts to build an airport, that was his first big start. How many blacks, I just want to know if you know this, they, they just revitalized Louis Armstrong Airport. It's called Louis Armstrong Airport now, uh, the new, instead of New Orleans International. But were there any blacks involved in that uh, the, uh, contract? I cannot name you one black that received a major kind, a prime contract at the airport. I cannot name you one. From Alden Parish. Mm-hmm. But they would do grab a, a black from out of state, get him to front, and make him think he's a prime, he's a, he's a prime contractor, but he actually front for white folks. We need blacks who live here in New Orleans to be the prime contractor. I came out to say more and get edited about the same more too. See, we learned a lot about contracting because the same was was the backbone of the construction industry. Yeah. The tile setters, the bricklayers. The carpenters, they came out that same world. I grew up in the same world. I grew up in the same in our project. The person I played baseball for at St. Raymond, uh, 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 playground, we have named a new friend. He was a contractor. He, he was a, he made bricks. Raymond Aguilar, who played ball at, 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 at St. O. His daddy was a bricklayer. <laughs> You had great layers and confidence all over the same world. But you know how they put them out of business? In order for you to get this contract, you have to have a big bond. You have to have a payment bond. You have to have general liability. Yeah. You have to have a pop sum general liability insurance. So in other words, the deal is that you put all this insurance out there. And so in order to get an insurance policy to do that, you just got to work. You have to show that you have done a job five thousand dollars, five million dollars, or ten million dollars or more. And so today, I know of no black that I know of in this in this state that ever done a ten million dollar construction job. So they use they using bonding. And, and what's the problem as a requirement for you to get a contract? So, in other words, if you're a contract, you'd be the best contract in the world. If you can't get bonded, you're not going to get the contract. And these racist banks are not making loans for you, but they can pinch you. So, blacks in the world are caught between a rock and a hard place. Yeah. What does man do? Come with a one stop shop in city government. They had blocks get finance from the Boston Corporation. He set up in, his, in, in the city hall an uh, insurance program where you can get bonded and general liability insurance. And that's why blacks have been so successful in the city of Atlanta, Georgia, in the construction industry. Mm -hmm. Even the motor system that runs from the airport throughout Atlanta all the way up to uh, uh, what I might call the post Alpharetta. Yeah, the busing system, yeah, they're pretty good. Right. So what yeah. I'm saying to you, they were able to get the, 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 the finance into the first Boston Corporation. They loaned a five times back the money. And they set up a one-stop shop inside the city government that if you needed insurance, you can get insurance. But this have never been done in New Orleans. Yeah. What? They claim they have a one-stop shop in New Orleans. Yeah. That one-stop shop is a joke. There's no one-stop shop in New Orleans. Right. And but in a Delel came here, who was the man of CEO. And see what happened. Next four, I'll sit up one and sit all. But that's received no support from the city council. And put this plan together. I met with her. She met with with Dutch Moore around this at all. And who's that? Uh, Gina Darnell. Gina Darnell. Gina Jackson, CEO, chief administrative officer. Okay. And she was a she worked also. I worked with her with the Southern Cross Leadership Conference. They have had two CEOs. 
Tony Cook was involved in the civil rights movement, and Emma Donnell. That's what you had in New Orleans. I could like the depression once they get elected. They ain't scared to hire anybody with a civil rights background. But they feared it might upset their campaign contributors. They don't want nobody around. They got a civil rights background. They don't want to hire you. Because they feel you unbossed and unbossed. That if you see something wrong, you're going to speak out about it. Yeah. Okay? Let me give you a perfect example. Today, Louisiana is the most gerrymandered state in the deep south. Today, Louisiana is the most segregated state in the deep south. They go in the census. Once they complete the census, they're going to draw the district line. Same from the Louisiana Legislative Black Caucus about this. Uh, I can't say that I have. Have you heard anything about the office from the Audience Fair School Board? No, sir. Have you heard anything from the city council? No. Nothing. Well, let me just say this. Bob, he's been on the board of the National Voting Rights Museum that deals with nine states. They've been conducting seminars and town hall meetings in the city of Atlanta, in the city of Georgia, state of Georgia, in the state of Georgia, from Atlanta down to Savannah. They've held about eight town hall meetings and seminars to educate folks about redistricting and gerrymandering. In the state of Alabama, they've had five. They moved from Mobile to Huntsville. Mobile sits on the Tennessee border. Educating blacks how to protect their vote. How to use it as a means of making progress. Now, in, 20, in 2019, the Louisiana Democratic Party in this state, was headed up by a black female. The National Democratic Party gave $350,000 to get blacks a seat at the Democratic table. Have you heard anything about that? No, I can't say that I've heard anything about that. The best way to keep people ignorant is keep them uninformed. So why is that state of Alabama? State of Georgia, in Mississippi, they can have workshops and forums to educate black folks. See, certain things that you have to know when you sit down and talk about drawing district lines and, and trying to protect the vote. See, and I've been dealing with it for 55 years, okay? But, and, and redistricting, people are talking about what's deep redistricting? Redistricting refers to the process by which census data is used to redraw the lines and boundaries of an electoral district within a state. Now they got four racist tricks white people use in Louisiana to cut down on the number of elected seats. I want you all to li listen very carefully. These four tricks, and that's I'll give you the name, but I'm going to explain them how they work. The first one is called passion. The second one is cracking. The third one is tracking. Tracking means if you got a chance to elect two black state representatives, if you made both districts 60 60 in population, what they would do, they would make one district 80% black. And so what happened? If they're making 80, that's it. They, they're passing them with the black folks. In one district, when you, you got a chance to elect two, if you're making 60, 60. So that's cut down on the number of black seats. Then question. Breaking up the black community. New Orleans East is a black community. Would you agree on that? It is a predominantly black community. Be a game uh, neighborhood, play. yeah. Okay, now New Orleans Bay, we have like 70,000 people about New Orleans Bay. This region runs from the St. Tammany Parish line through New Orleans East to the Lower Night Wall. 
for the line of fame in our parish. Mm-hmm. That is called an elongated district, a gerrymandering. But they cracked it. So it divided, and uh, New Orleans is up. So uh, you have uh, someone in District D representing parts of New Orleans East but that runs past near Free Football. So why is somebody from District D representing represent part of New Orleans East? That's cracking. We're not going to let you have a compact community. We're going to divide New Orleans East up as much as possible. See, when you compact and organize, you got power. But if I break you up and divide you up, you got less power. Would you agree on that? Uh, yeah. Now, there's another trick they use on black folks called cracking. For example, cracking is the primary cause. Asa Abrams lost her the seat as governor of Georgia. Now, cracking, cracking himself, cracking, is when they track young black people. Now, you finish high school. And you go to college. When you're in college, you become a registered voter. And you register at your mother's address. When you get out of college and get a job, you move out to your mother's and father's house. And get a partner about your own house. They got a program set up by the Republican Party called Re- Registration Cross Check Program. They check it on young blacks and other minorities between the ages of 18 and 30. Mm-hmm. To see whether they still live at their father's house, or father's house. And if you got your own address and your own uh, uh, apartment house, they're going to take you off the road and say, you don't live at the address where you registered at. But you, you, you register legally, so we're going to take you off the road. That trick was used in Georgia when Stacey Abrams was running for governor. They took over 600,000 young folks off the road. Maybe I'm a wife. It took off. Because they assumed they were going to vote for Tracy, Stacey Adams. Stacey Abrams, I'm sorry, Stacey Abrams. That's a trick called tracking. They've been tracking a young folk for years. And they check and see if they live at the address they registered at. And if they're not living there, they take them off the road. The first time I it really hit home to me, my daughter enrolled in University of Louisiana at Lafayette. Yeah. Leave out Monday morning or Sunday night and come back Friday evening. I received a letter in the mail said, We have reason to believe that you don't live at this address. I mean, he already knew she was working on her master down in Lafayette. Who told her she was living down there? They talk then. Young folks. And black people, if you uh, at your parents' home and you got your own apartment, you need to get your address changed. So that's what they're using today called tracking and a program called Registration Cross Check Program. And the Secretary of State is working with these Republicans and letting them know that we found about 2,000 people black that live at another address. So take them off the road. That's the call tracking on black folks. And last but not least is the one called gerrymandering. Gerrymandering is the drawing of electoral district, districts to give one group or party an advantage over another. Let me put that for the soul on it. Gerrymandering, the drawing of election districts to give one group or party an unfair advantage over another. This is the most gerrymandered state in the East Coast, Louisiana. And, 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 and let, let, let me just give you a few numbers so you can be clear on this. And, it, and, 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 and this is very serious that they can go down here and they can sit down here and draw district lines and cut down on the number of black potential seats. And this is a very racist type thing they're using in Louisiana and the people who are elected to represent us. They gotta have them gotten hip to the game. And it's a very slip game. Let, 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 let me just give you a clear picture. First of all, you gotta know the population. Today, white in Louisiana. 
גם 56% אחרי. רק talking about is pre-trial intervention okay, you talk about pre-trial intervention in criminal cases Thank when you're talking yeah. you think about that? Uh, I think not too many I did I learned it also in my uh, practice as well Well, it's not even just the right to vote as well. You also lose your gun rights. You can lose your, uh, you know, of course, it's hard to find a job. There are a number of things that come from that once you get a felony record. But, yeah. Now, that's why your program is so important. You're educating people. Let me just give you a breakdown of some of the most important elected positions in Louisiana. That whites don't uh, understand that we are not being represented. We got U.S. congressmen. We got six seats. One black. She had the Richmond seat. Again, white make up 56% of the population. How can you be 56% of the population? They got six seats. You occupy five of them. State Supreme Court judges, seven seats. Uh, Judge Barnett Johnson uh, is retiring. Yes. You got seven state Supreme Court judges. You got seven seats and one black. What's wrong with that picture? Mm-hmm. State Senator C, nine seats. I think today we might have 10 blacks. State Representative, 105 seats. We might have 25 blacks. Now, one of the most important boards in this state is the Bessie board. I'll keep on that. We've got 11 seats, only two blacks. That is serious, man. When whites only make up 56% of the population. We took over in Selma. Okay. For the National Voting Rights Museum. That's where the cost of Selma to Montgomery took office in Selma, Alabama. There are nine states. Every year, Louisiana ran number one when it comes down to violating the Voting Rights Act of African Americans in the state. And the Times Picayune and the and the full television station, they will never educate you about this. But that's where the control people is keep them uninformed. Every year. This is one of the most racist states in America. We analyzed Barack Obama's campaign in those nine states. 
Barack Obama ran in 2008. In Louisiana, he received less than 6% of the vote. As a sitting president, he ran in 2012. He received less than 6% of the white vote. Out of the nine states with complete coverage, he received less votes in 2008 and 2012 in Louisiana. Let me give you those nine states. That's with complete coverage under the voting place at. Alabama, Alaska, Arizona, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, South Carolina, Texas, and Virginia. Think about it. Nine states in each year. Louisiana people voting rights in Louisiana. How many times you read about this in the advocate, the time picking you an advocate newspaper? Well, it's not talked about. How many times you have seen this, uh, this on television? They're not going to tell you this. Mm -hmm. If I can keep you ignorant, I can control you. But you can't depend on them to educate black folks about what affects them. Or a program like your program. I listen to your program. I watch you on TV. You do a hell of a job of educating the public about what the hell is going on. So how many attorneys in this? I, I can't speak for them. <laughs> thank you. But I know a lot of attorneys. I, I, thank you. But I know a lot of attorneys, too, uh, just to say, just to clarify in their practice. I know of some who do great things in helping a lot of people get off uh, and recover their not only their voting rights, but also their gun rights, their rights to get back to normal. They do expungements, uh, things of that nature. But, uh, you know, I just started just coming on on the channel as because uh i was tired of getting rejections uh you know for instance they won't put uh positive black images uh straight and i'm talking about straight heterosexual african-american males on tv anymore it doesn't exist and so i just decided i was going to go on and i just started using my channel that i had and uh you know i've just been doing it so I've been watching you ever since you graduated from law school to something. You've been involved in the issues that impact black folks. What motivated you to do that? What motivated me to uh, do do what, Mr. Galvin? To be involved in dealing with civil rights and human rights issues. Well, I mean, I've always been involved with it as even as a kid, uh, as a teenager. Uh, I started getting involved in that, uh, you know, as a little kid. Uh, we used to have black history programs and uh, just seeing things that were going on at that time. Uh, you know, I was a kid. I remember when the O.J. Simpson case took off, you know, and I saw Johnny Cochran. That's what made me want to be an attorney. And then uh, well, one of the inspirations and then just uh, I didn't like unfairness. I liked and I like to argue with people. Uh, I like to go back and forth. And so I would just see stuff like that. And then. Uh, I guess my third eye got open when I saw the 2000 election with Bush versus Gore. And we saw that Al Gore actually won uh, that race, but they gave that to George W. So I, uh, you know, I had been start, you know, I always had an interest in doing it as a kid. And so that's what motivated me. And this was what keeps me going so far. Dr. King made the statement that nothing that motivates you to get involved in you know, the epiphany statement. What motivated me to get involved in, in civil rights was I grew up in the same and our project. That's, that's not too far from City Hall. Mm -hmm. Growing up, we couldn't even use City Hall, although my parents paid taxes. Right. And I remember when I used to go on Canal Street with my mother sometime when I was very young. And she used to tell me, Use the bathroom. If you want some water, drink some water. And I'm not going to let you use the toilet. But when I got older, and I went in the store one day, and I went by myself, I was going to enter the bathroom. And I looked over, and I saw two water fountains. One, the blacks, they had tap water. Right next to that, they had cool water, cold water. 
And I saw a white guy in there one day go and get a uh, take some water in his mouth, rinse his mouth out, and spit right there. Folks. And I said to him, I said, I'd be damned. And I thought about what my mother said. You're not going to drink no water on Canal Street. And all those stores on Canal Street, they had those fountains. Tap water for black folks, or ice water for white folks. It got on the same on our parish bus. It paid the same fare. They had a sign that said, colored patrons only. We had to sit behind that sign. And many times they might just take those signs and move them back. That forced many blacks to stand up while they're riding the bus. And I thought about those things. And I began to get all the read about A.P. Turo, who lived on Parker Street. Yeah, his birthday just passed for on, on Friday. What's that? His birthday just passed. His anniversary of his birth was this Friday, February You know, 26th. a lot of people in this city don't know about A.P. Turo. Yeah. And that was my mother, A.P. Turo. Right. But what I'm saying is that it's not a major street in this city named after A.P. Turo. I remember in the early 50s, he filed a lawsuit to get equal pay for black people. In some cases, white people uh, paying white teachers 25% more than black teachers. Yeah. I remember he integrated the school. They talk about the young lady going down to William Friends School, Ruby Bridges. Ruby Bridges, yeah. The man who handled that lawsuit was A.P. Turo. Yeah. Uh, you know, I remember I played ball in North. The man who integrated North was A.P. Turo. Right. The street where St. August is named after him. A lot of people, uh, I don't think a lot of people, unless they're close here in New Orleans, uh, especially those that live around St. August and so forth, know about that. I mean, the school that they have for him, uh, our, you know, our school, St. August, you know, they renamed him. So uh, I always knew of AP Turo myself. Uh, and matter of fact, when I was in law school, I met his son, AP Turo Jr. Uh, oh, you're right. Yeah, who actually was one the first to black to integrate LSU, because uh, Dutch Morial integrated LSU Law School and was the first to graduate there. But he, uh, but I know that he was actually yeah. So his son told us all stories about him and. I mean, the information is online. People can actually go on Wikipedia and just look up AP Turo and the things that he did, uh, you know, being close associated with Thurgood Marshall and the NAACP, working on those cases, uh, you know, things of that nature, filing suit against LSU on behalf of his son. That's how his son became the first black student at LSU, uh, you know, working also with, uh, you know, again, with the NAACP, I believe if he was part of that now versus Board of Education. Right, right. Well, let me tell you something. I, I, I see what he talk about naming different streets after African-American heroes and she wrote. Uh-huh. I feel if, 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 if the people who will be appointed to select names they were named South Broad Street after A.P. Turo. If they serious, okay? They were named South Broad after A.P. Turo, okay? That's what they would do. Because he made a major contribution for his life on the line, okay? Yeah. I remember I grew up in that airport. I know some couple of guys were scared to talk with his daughters because they... Was scared of the white folks. Okay? So what I'm saying to you, the deal is that the people who they selected to want to rename certain streets and 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 and, and certain uh, schools. I looked at a number of names. They have about as much involvement in civil rights as human rights as David Duke. White folks know how I want to run a game on black folks. 
they know how to select the right black. Now, I worked renaming schools in Alden Parish. Yes, we talked about we that. To, we were able to rename 26 schools. On the black board members, they have taken the names off of 16 schools that no longer exist. We had a school named after Dr. Ronald McNair. That name was on the school prior to him changing the name. It was named after Robert E. Lee on Carrollton Avenue. Mm -hmm. Dr. Ronald McNair was NASA. considered a genius in physics, laser physics. He got a PhD in laser physics, the first black in America, and he was he died in Challenger. Right. That, that was school, in Robert E. Lee was changed to uh, uh, Ronald McNair. Right. In other schools, one school named after uh, Israel Augustine. S.J. Peterson, that name was changed to uh, Israel Augustine, right on Tulane and Row. It took Israel, name, Israel Augustine name off that school. Herbert Marshall, that, that school was named after Bur the prior to that with Beauregard, the man who fired the shot to start the Civil War. Right, P.T. P. T. Beauregard. Uh, uh, P.T. Beauregard. name is no longer on the school. Yeah. But the majority of black school boards sit there and a black superintendent. And they allowed the white folks to convince them to take those names off the school. Out of 26 schools we renamed, they, they have gotten rid of 16 names. Right. With the majority black school board and the black superintendent. What are they representing? Yeah. And, you know, uh, there's, you know, no schools named after Oscar Dunn or after PBS pins back. Hell, if we're talking military leaders, uh, you know, we can look at also Martin Delaney, who was the highest ranking Civil War, Negro Civil War soldier in the Union Army. He was a doctor. Thank you. A former slave. He was Thank also you. the father of black nationalism. Uh, this is Oscar Dunn. Uh, you can't see the screen, uh, Mr. Gallon, but that's Oscar Dunn. He was, I'm showing everybody, he was a uh, Republican lieutenant governor of Louisiana during the era of construction. He succeeded PBS Pinchback in that role as Pinchback was the first black governor and the only black governor in this state uh, during Reconstruction, although he served only for a brief period, I think 34 days, if I'm not mistaken. So he, uh, yeah, there are certainly a number of people that they could redeem the schools uh, after if they chose to, and even the streets of heroes, especially if they're talking about serving the military uh, and so forth. But I uh bring a case in point. Bring uh -huh. a case in point. Uh back in 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 in, in uh that was uh in nineteen ninety four. I got involved in the issue of renaming school. Yeah. I was at Endemian Parade. And it got there kind of late, and I was behind a number of white folks. Yeah. And that got a thirty five was Endemian Parade and the band proceeded by. And the white folks, people I could care about, actually, they weren't from Louisiana. And they told them that that band named after John McDonald. Yeah. And some of the white folks said, yeah, they thought it was the funniest thing they ever seen in their life. But all black band marching up down in St. Charles Avenue, named after the largest slave owner in the history of North America. John McDonald on 1,800 slaves. Yeah. And yet, that... Well, he is a he, he is a black band named after John McDonough. And white folks are laughing at the black student wearing a band uniform with John McDonough's name on it. Yeah, I uh, and, and I. That's about it. That's, that's well, um, right, but didn't he give uh, at, uh, upon his death like millions, uh, like a large money amount of money? I'm reading this here in his will for to educate poor whites and free people of color. And that's why they gave him, that's why his those schools are named after him. Well, let, let, let me, let me, let me, let me get that lie straight, but they've been putting out there for years. Okay. John McDonald died in 1838. It says 1850. Now, 1838 when he died. There was no public schools in Louisiana in 1838. Now, I've been to Monrovia Liberia. And I had babies by Jacobine Wives. Mm -hmm. The first role of American Colonization Society. When he went around, picked up 
young mixed blood kids, kids who was mulattoes, opera rooms, and court rooms, put them on a boat and shipped them to West Africa. They didn't send them back to Africa because they weren't born in Africa. And they have organized a colony called Liberia. And they were shipped to Liberia and they have organized a colony. If you go to the library in Monrovia, Liberia, they got information regarding John McDonald. And he sent money sometime to them. Are you aware today? In 2021, the currency in, in Liberia is the American dollar. It was initiated because John McDonald gave money to his offspring and helped organize a colony called Liberia. That's the library. There's nothing in that library by John McDonough giving two million dollars to build schools in Louisiana. Now, my husband and I filed a lawsuit against Bank One. Bank One, Bank One purchased, purchased two banks. That was the biggest lenders in this city. They launched white book money to buy slaves, and they slept slaves as collateral at these two banks. That was Canal Bank. And Citizen Bank. We looked at all the banks that was in Louisiana at that time. We could not find anything about John McDonald giving two million dollars to Louisiana to open public school. And the money wasn't in the bank. I'm quite sure he didn't even put it in the mayonnaise jar or shoebox. What bank did have that two million dollars in? And when John McDonald left, he, he left money to build schools. That's the biggest lie I've been told to people. Not telling anybody in all these school boards. Give me a name of a bank that John McDonald is going to put this $2 million in. It was people from the same war that led the fight to stop black folks from going down. So called McDonald, they putting a wreath on his statue after all the white kids it went before them put on there. It was people like uh, Rico Sartik. Uh, uh, Arthur Chaffertal, A.P. Kuro, and many, uh, uh, Kudo, many blacks in that same war led to fight the stopping blacks from putting on those blue pants and white shirts, going down and fanning that hot sun and putting a wreath on John McDonough's statue. Uh, John McDonough left money to build schools. John McDonough money had never been used in build a school for black folks from the ground up. That's the biggest lie we've been told to black folks in Louisiana. And I can't, I'll debate anybody on that subject. Whether he left money to build schools for black folks. The few schools that black folks use, like McDonough 35, McDonough, they were hand me down schools that came from white people and they got tired of using those schools. They were run down. They turned them over to black folks. So we have received a serious message education here in Louisiana about the education system. And I want somebody to show me a document where John McDonald left two million dollars to build a new school in Louisiana. Okay. He became famous because the American Colonization Society, he bankrolled that. He got all these light skinned kids out of New Orleans because they wanted the same rights as the white Anglo Saxon kid that lived above Canal Street. That's why we had the new program. To separate the so called uh, uh, white folks from the so-called people of color and black folks living east of Canal Street. So we've been fed a bunch of lies about this education system in all these parts. Mm -hmm. Go and look up the map and colonization society and see who banks roll that deal. John McDonald's bank roll that. He was the leader right. getting these mixed buddy kids out of out of out of New Orleans because they were they were trouble banks. And that documentation, you ever go to Liberia, West Africa, go to the library in, 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 in Monrovia, Liberia, you will find that scholarship in the library there in Monrovia, Liberia. Okay. And I'll debate anybody in the all the school system, I'll debate any PhD or no D about whether or not John McDonald left $2 million to build schools in all these parts. All right. Mr. Galman, I've had you on for an hour and 30 minutes. I said an hour. It's always good talking to you because I know you're there to have a job. 
educate you. Thank you. You know, but you keep on doing what you're doing, brother. So I hope one day that you will run for public office because uh, ain't too many sincere brothers in this city. But many of them are talking now saying nothing. You stick and took the power. So have a great day. Thank you, Mr. Galvin, and uh, I welcome you to come back on anytime. All right, brother. You take care and keep on practicing law. Will do, sir. We'll be in touch. Keep fighting for the people. I'll be proud of you, brother. All right. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you. God bless. All right, guys. That was Carl Galvin. I just want to say something. I was correcting him earlier from what I read on the Wikipedia web page that said McDonough died in 1850, not 1838. You guys saw me say that, but uh, Mr. Galvin is a uh, essentially, especially about Louisiana and New Orleans politics. I wanted to have him come on because of this, uh, essentially, and I don't, you know, of course, now I'm going to be real with you, especially for a lot of my followers. You follow me uh, he is part of that, you know, he is part of those baby boomer crowd, that baby boomer crowd uh, from the 1940s. You know, he's very steadfast on voting and the importance of voting and, uh, you know, helping get Barack Obama in office, things of that nature. You know, I don't know where I'm going with it, but uh, he has a wealth of information uh, and I don't doubt his love and his uh, support for black people in this country. Uh, and especially in this area, he's been involved in that fight for a long time uh, in doing some things. So I wanted him to come on because he has a wealth of information to share with you all. A lot of you appreciate it. I see Rosalind. What's up, Rosalind from Philadelphia? To Galman. Uh, we also have someone else here, Vulcan205. Uh, what's up, Vulcan? It says exactly. So I don't know how the hell Biden won Georgia uh, November. I, if I had gotten him, that's another thing, guys. If I had gotten to the point where we were going to be talking about the election 2020, I know he was going to be pro Biden and so forth. I tried to uh, stay away from all of it, uh, per se. I wanted to focus on some stuff that you guys hadn't heard because we were talking about gerrymandering and uh, also voter suppression, things of that nature things that affect Louisiana politics down here, but also have an impact on the entire country. There's some things that you may have learned from hearing this. Mr. Galvin, you didn't call Main Street, excuse me, on mainstream media. And we have to be uh, the new black media, as he says. That was something very uh, powerful. This is Baby Boomers, 1946 to 1964. Well, he was born in 1940. So six years removed from that. He was still still a baby at that time. He was born during World War II, during uh, the, b before World War II started for the United States, but uh, he was still a child when all of that stuff was going on. And, you know, he was around whatever John Lewis would be, you know, he was a little bit of, he, was, he and John Lewis are the same age. John Lewis was born in 1940 as was uh, Mr. Galvin. And uh, he uh, certainly has a wealth of information. As I said again, uh, he's somebody that I think you guys would be interested in hearing from. And I wanted to have him come on because we had been talking about it. So when you share things, especially when we talk about the Negro League, uh, you know, a lot of people forget that you actually had, and I didn't mention this to him, but the Negro Leagues, of course, were even owned by some wealthy uh, black men, who is the king of jazz, and especially here in the New Orleans area. Uh, he actually had ownership uh, in many in a, the New Orleans uh, Negro Leagues. In fact, uh, the name of the baseball team, um, trying to get the name of it here, escapes me. I even read about this earlier. The team was the Armstrong Secret Nine. That's it. The Secret Nine. Okay. Yeah, this is it here. Let me stop the video just so you guys can see a little bit of some black history. Since it is the last day in Black History Month. But we celebrate black history all year long. We don't just need the month to tell us when to celebrate our heroes. 
Armstrong Secret Nine, also known as the Raggedy Nine, was sponsored by American jazz musician Louis Armstrong in 1931 in his hometown of New Orleans, Louisiana. Both softball and baseball teams during the jazz age, uh, the popularity of, popularity of baseball made for an attractive medium used by American entertainers and public figures for self-promotion. And so big bands led by Louis Armstrong and Count Basie, Harry James, Tommy Dorsey, and Benny Goodman uh, were used for softball and baseball teams. So they used uh, <laughs> the Raggedy Nine. Uh, you see Louis Armstrong right there. So that was in 1931. That was in 1931. So just imagine uh all of that stuff that was going on you know during his time stuff he saw okay so he would be silent generation okay so the silent generation you said he's not a baby boomer but silent generation uh that was the generation was comparatively small that was the era between the Great Depression, which was in the 1930s and World War II, so in the early to mid-1940s. And fewer people were having children back then. So they call it the silent generation. And of course, Mr. Galvin is an exception because he is nowhere silent, nowhere near silent. Uh, he's going to be talking. So I was a privilege to have him come on. I uh, Before we get out of here... I just want to give you guys some updates. I want you to tune in on tomorrow, on Tuesday, actually. Uh, Tuesday, we're going to have, uh, it was a pleasure to have him come on. Tuesday, I'm going to have Albert Lanier come on this channel because we are going to be talking about uh, regards to the death of Sam Cooke. I've had some people, I believe it may have been Rosalind or... Uh, whoever, a few people in the chat that have come on. All right, Squeaky G, I haven't seen you in ages, man. I take it you've been working. But, uh, yes, he is. He's a host of, has a host of information. 1925. Yeah, the Armstrong 9. Yeah, they, uh, Bishop is looking up this stuff. But yeah, they, uh, as I was saying earlier, uh, he has a wealth of information. And tune in this Tuesday. Uh, I don't know who he meant who had the, uh, well, they were sponsored in 1931. So Armstrong and I couldn't have been 1925. Who are you talking about with the champs? Bishop Scott. But this Tuesday, Albert Lanier, he is a freelance journalist. He will be joining my channel. On Tuesday at 8 o'clock my time, 8 o'clock Central, uh, we are going to be talking about the death of Sam Cooke. I met him through uh, Valerie Denise Jones. Shout out to her and the Judge Joe Brown show. You guys need to check that out every Friday at 3 p.m. Central, 4 o'clock Eastern time. Bishop is a guest on the show, uh, as well as Brother Bernard, who you all saw me do a show with uh, yesterday on live stream. Shout out to him. Uh, you guys should come and check that out. Uh, we're going to be talking about Sam Cooke. I wanted to redo this because I had people asking about it. And, of course, Sam Cooke's death. Uh, people in this, uh, people still wonder about his death and the circumstances surrounding it, given the uh, two documentaries that have come out in recent years, including Two Killings of Sam Cooke on Netflix and Lady You Shot Me, which is a documentary that is on uh, Apple, as well as I believe Amazon, if I'm not mistaken, but I believe I know for a fact now it's also on YouTube that it's been made available. So 
It's an hour and eight minute documentary. You guys may want to check it out while you're free to get uh, refurbished on some things because we're going to go deep into the death of Sam Cooke on Tuesday at eight. You guys do not want to miss that. Uh, this has been a great productive program. I appreciate you all for joining me. I need you to please get the likes, shares, and subscribes up. If you could please donate to the Cash App, Gavin Richard Esquire, Google Pay, Gavin.GRich1 at gmail.com or to the PayPal, I would greatly appreciate it. Guys, enjoy the rest of this beautiful Sunday. It is for a walk. Uh, you said Hilldale. Mr. Scott says Hilldale. Uh, in 1925, he's talking about 1925. You know, Moses Fleetwood Walker, guys, and here's another um, unknown black history. He was actually considered to be the first black person, the first person, actual Negro in the major leagues. Here's a picture of him right here. Moses Fleetwood Walker. I'm going to get off before I get off. I want you guys to see this because this is still Black History Month. Oh, yes, it has not changed. That is Moses Fleetwood Walker. And according to Wikipedia, was an American professional baseball catcher who was credited with being one of the first black men to play in the MLB a native of Mount Pleasant, Ohio, and a star athlete at Oberlin College, as well as the University of Michigan. Walker played for semi-professional and minor league baseball clubs before joining the Toledo Blue Sox stockings of the American Association for the 1884 season. I'm just skipping through this. Through research by the Society for American Baseball Research indicates William Edward White, was the first African-American baseball player in the major leagues. Walker, unlike White, was the first to be open about his black heritage and to face the racial bigotry so prevalent in the late 19th century United States. His brother, Weldy, became the second black athlete to do likewise in the same year, also for the Toledo Ball Club. Walker just played one season, 42 games total for Toledo before injuries entailed his release. says here, after his baseball career, he became a successful businessman and inventor. And as an advocate of black nationalism, Walker also jointly edited a newspaper called The Equator with his brother. He published the book, Our Home Colony, to explore the ideas of immigrating back to Africa. He died in 1924 at the age of 67. And here is his brother, Weldy. He was the second African-American to play MLB sports. Uh, MLB, and was an editor of that paper with his brother. That's him there. And they uh, promoted the idea of going back to Africa. Uh, they were active in the Back to Africa movement. Of course, that was spearheaded by one Marcus Mosiah Garvian, hey, talking about Liberia, Liberia, excuse me, Liberia, 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 Liberia. Liberia, Liberia. Liberia, I'm sorry, guys. Liberia, as um, Mr. Galman mentioned, this is a this is it here. Of course, you notice the same red, white, and blue flag. It's the national anthem. And English is the official language. Michael Jackson's uh, hit, one of my favorite songs on the Bad Album, is called Liberian Girl. So I love listening to that. Uh, you guys, uh, we're going to go get out of here. I'm going to put the link up where you could actually see this. Uh, you guys can check out Mr. Moses Fleetwood Walker. He will be my topic for black history because this brother was an inventor and obviously did some great things in his later life uh it says here that 
he patented four he patented four inventions uh including an outer casing in 1891 with regards to uh firing artillery artillery shells with gunpowder rather than compressed air so he patented an outer casing and There's a lot of information on him. I'm going to put the link up. You guys can read about that. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you, Vulcan. I'm glad you guys enjoyed the show. You said Trump is about to speak at CPAC today. Uh, you want to check that out, Bishop? I'm sure you will. I might take a look at it. I actually want to do another video. Uh, I'm going to work on my podcast because I got to address some things in regards to uh, Obama and the reparations argument. So you guys can check that out on my podcast on Anchor. I'll probably leave a link and do a video for it as well so you guys can listen to it. Uh, But you guys be safe and be blessed. I will uh, see you all in the next one. Tuesday night, 8 o'clock, Al Lanier. Don't forget the murder of Sam Cooke. All right, guys. Peace and love. I'll holla.